Throughout October, I have played the game with some fantastic bug-type Pokémon. Scyther, Scissor, Cleavor, and Pinsir all ranked very highly because of access to Swords Dance. Heracross was decent as well, it had Reversal and Endure for Red, which proved to be a really reliable strategy. If I had stopped playing bug-types there, I think we would all think more highly of this typing than it really deserves. So today, I want to play two bugs that are not nearly as good. The regional bugs, Ariados and Ladian. I'm going to be completing solo playthroughs for both as well as follow-up attempts, so stick around to the end of the video to see which one wins. These are the main rules for my playthroughs, you can find a more detailed copy in the description. Let's start things with Ariados, the bug poison type. For base stats, it has 70 HP, 90 attack, 70 defense, 40 speed, 60 special attack, and special defense. Also surprisingly, it, as well as Ladian, both have fast growth rates. The reason I say this is surprising is because typically this growth rate is reserved for pink Pokemon or fairies, so it's surprising to see these two regional bugs get access to it. Overall, it's not the best growth rate to do solo challenges with, that is definitely the medium slow growth rate, but fast is second place, because after level 30, it really starts getting an advantage over all the other growth rates. But the momentum from the early game gives the medium slow growth rate the edge. And uh, speaking of momentum in the early game, Ariados is going to have none of that. Its starting set is Poison Sting, String Shot, Scary Face, and Constrict. I guess it's nice that we get a same type attack bonus move, but it only has a base power of 15. That's not very good. Also, the fact that we get both String Shot and Scary Face is kind of an insult, plus Constrict, one of the worst damage dealing moves in any Pokemon game. Did you know that its secondary effect is lowering the opponent's speed? Yeah, so we have three moves that speed control the opponent, and all of them are bad speed control moves at that. Through level up, things do not get better. At level 6, it gets Scary Face again. At level 11, Constrict again. And then finally, at level 17, it learns a new move, which is going to be decently useful, Nightshade, which deals damage equal to the user's level. Beyond that, its level up learn set is kind of strange. Leech Life, Fury Swipes, Spider Web, and Agility. Uh, the last of these is going to be useful, but beyond that, at level 63, it gets Psychic. A very strange move for a bug poison type to learn, especially when its special attack is significantly lower than its physical attack. Initially looking at this set, it's Halloween themed because it scared me. The only same type of attack bonus moves I get are Poison Sting and Leech Life, which are of course not very good. Luckily through TM and HM, Ariados does learn Sludge Bomb, which is a base 90 power move and will get the same type of attack bonus. Beyond that, it also gets some coverage, Giga Drain, Solar Beam, Dig, and Psychic. Although two of these moves are from Kanto and one of them is after Claire, Solar Beam. Dig is going to be the only realistic coverage I get access to before that. Well, outside of the normal type moves. But it doesn't learn Headbutt or Swift, so I guess we're going to be seeing a lot of return today. Well, maybe not too much because Sludge Bomb is better. In the early game, it's definitely going to be important for Aerodos to level up as much as possible. I'm fighting wild Pokemon as well as optional trainers because I want to make sure that I'm a decent level for Faulkner. The flying type has an advantage over me and the only moves I'm going to have access to are Poison Sting and Constrict. Even if I leveled all the way up to 17 and got Nightshade, it wouldn't affect them because all of the flying types in the first gym are also normal types. Like I said before though, the fast growth rate is not better than the medium slow growth rate in the early game, so I'm not leveling up particularly quickly. By the time I reach Violet City, Ariados is only level 9, which is definitely not good enough. I'll go to Sprout Tower for now and battle a bunch of Bell Sprout for additional experience. After meeting the rival, I had to make the decision if I wanted to face the final Sage or not. In this case, I decided not to just because Poison Sting is getting a little bit low on PP, and I don't want to be relying on Constrict. So I use the escape rope, head back to the Pokemon Center to heal, and then into the gym to face Bird Keeper Abe. This guy is terrifying in most solo challenges, especially when you're weak to flying type moves. Luckily, Ariados' defense is decent, and I'm not taking that much from Peck. Poison Sting is doing more than enough, and I defeat his spear leveling up to 13. I really hope that this level is going to be enough for Faulkner. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. His lead Pidgey is not that scary for Ariados. Instead of prioritizing Mud Slap, it's choosing Tackle. I take only a tiny amount of damage before he sends in his Pidgeotto. Now this one does have Gust, which can do decent damage. I was hoping for an early Poison, and I do get one with my second hit. Then my Berry activates, and this gives me enough health. Well, maybe not, because the Pidgeotto does crit. However, I was doing enough damage, so I'm able to finish off his Ace and earn myself the first badge. 
This one gives all the trainer's Pokémon a 12.5% boost to their attack stat. Which does improve the damage that Poison Sting is going to do, but very soon I need to replace it with Nightshade, because that is the best next move that I can learn. The early game is pretty awful for Ariados. Since you can get Spinarak in the early game, I, I don't really know what would incentivize the player to keep this thing on their team long term. With Butterfree in Generation 1, there was definitely a reason. It completely destroys Brock, and it's fantastic against the Poison types, which are very plentiful in Canada. I think it would have been interesting if they had given Ariados something like Fury Cutter early on, or maybe Twin Needle. That way, it could be at least a little bit more useful. On my way to Union Cave, I fight almost every optional trainer just for experience, but I still don't get to level 17. Outside of the cave, on Fridays, Frida will appear to give you the Poison Bar, which gives a 10% boost to Poison-type moves. I completely forgot about her because I normally don't pick up this item, so Ariados isn't going to get the small boost to Poison Sting, which would have been nice. Although Nightshade is just around the corner, inside Slow poke well. I continue leveling inside of Bugsy's gym to get more damage with this ghost type move, and hopefully at level 19 it's going to be enough to take on the gym leader. Okay, we'll go through his team and their health stats. 40 for the Metapod, 38 for the Kakuna, and 50 for the Scyther. At level 19, I'm going to 3-hit the Metapod, 2-hit the Kakuna, and 3-hit the Scyther. Against his ace, I briefly contemplated using Scary Face, but this doesn't make any sense. The Scyther isn't going to be doing nearly enough damage with Fury Cutter, so instead it's prioritizing Quick Attack, which is also not good enough. So that's my second badge. Bugsy also gives me the TM for Fury Cutter, but Ariados doesn't even learn this move, even by TM. I don't know what Game Freak was thinking about when the introduced all the new Johto Pokemon, they made all of them so bad. Imagine you pick this bug up in the early game, then you get the bug type badge, and also a bug type TM, but you can't teach it to the regional bug that you just obtained and likely evolved? That doesn't make a lot of sense, especially when they're trying to promote Fury Cutter as a sort of solution for Whitney's mill tank. Anyways, I guess they just expected you to catch a Pokemon in the bug catching contest and then teach Fury Cutter to it. Yeah, again, prioritizing the Cantonian Pokemon over the Jotonian Pokemon. Really disappointing. And uh, that's how I feel about the rival in Azalea Town. This battle is always brutal for most Pokemon. Today I have them choosing the Quilava team, which of course is the fire types. They're super effective against the bug types that I'm using. First turn, the Quilava's in battle, it hits Smokescreen, lowering my accuracy. Uh, because of this, I just miss, and then it knocks me out using Ember over many turns. I really should have won here. Anyways, I come in, try the fight again. Once again, due to accuracy, I miss too many times and fail to knock the Quilava out. So it takes me a total of three attempts to finally knock his ace out and then move on to the Zubat, which I can two hit with Nightshade. Now while I don't have access to Headbutt in the forest, I do get access to Dig in the National Park. And this is a decent counter to Whitney's Pokemon because Dig breaks Rollout's combo. I teach the move to Ariados in the place of Constrict, good riddance, and now it is time for the third gym leader. Alright, Clefairy's first. I can't set up here with Fury Cutter, which makes me really sad. I can use Dig, though. This is now my best move. It's only base 60 power, which is not great, but luckily it two shots her lead. Miltank is next, and I've kept Scary Face so I can lower its speed to ensure that it's not moving first. The cow goes for Stomp, flinching Ariados, then my Scary Face hits, and now I can use Dig to break its combo. Unfortunately for me, the ground type move is only doing roughly a fifth to Miltank, so if it continues attacking even with Stomp, I'm just just gonna lose. So there's no way for me to win this, because the mill tank's gonna do enough damage with either rollout or stomp. I tried again hoping I wouldn't get flinched by stomp, but even when I hit all of my digs, I still don't have enough health to survive the mill tank. I did a bit of extra training inside the gym, but this isn't gonna be enough to defeat Whitney all on its own. But there might be another way around her. I can talk to this guy in the department store and trade an Abra for a Machop. The reason I'm doing this is because the Machop is holding a gold berry, which is essentially a citrus berry. It heals 30 hit points. This is my new plan against mill tank, and right away, Stomp flinches me. Ah, oh, that's so frustrating! Okay, next turn it hits rollout, my scary face hits, and now I'm gonna use dig. This is doing a tiny bit more damage, but the gold berry heals me back to green health, and then Ariados gets a critical hit. I think that makes up for the fact that I got flinched on turn one, but because of the gold berry, I am able to finish off her ace and earn myself the third badge. This one gives Ariados a 
10% boost to its speed stat, which is much needed. This thing's quite slow. In my first playthroughs, just to make things a little bit more interesting for all of you watching and for me as the player, I fight Pseudo Wudo. I require myself to knock it out, and this actually gets really scary for Ariados. I tank a rock throw, which takes me down to 12 hit points because I didn't heal before the battle. Luckily, Dig is doing enough to two-shot, so I don't lose. Winning this fight levels me up to 25, where I learn Leech Life in the place of Poison Sting. I only wish this move had its Generation 7 base power. In this game, it's base 20 and 33 after Bugsy's type boost, as well as the same type attack bonus. I do a significant amount of training in the next section of the game. The Kimono Girls, I also go east to the Lake of Rage, fighting the trainers along the way. Unfortunately for me, Sludge Bomb isn't available right now, but Return is, and I realized that I didn't purchase myself another Abra, so I have to walk all the way back to Goldenrod City. This is a pretty big mistake. I continue Eridos' training at the Lighthouse. I'm fighting all the trainers in the surrounding regions because I want to make sure that the rival in Burnt Tower as well as Morty are both defeated quickly with minimal resets. Another reason I'm doing this is so I have enough speed to move first against the rival's Haunter. If I can go underground with Dig, then it won't be able to hit Curse on turn 1. And this is really important when I'm using the 2 turn ground type move. If I'm taking Curse damage every time I use it, then I'm most likely going to lose the battle. Luckily for me, Haunter as well as the following Kolava are both one shots. The Magnemite continues this trend, leaving only the Zubat, which is incompetent. Morty's lead is Ghastly, but because I already one-shot the rival's Haunter, I know that I'm going to one-shot here. His second Pokémon, which is Haunter, might be able to survive, but in this case it looks like Eridos just has enough damage. Gengar, on the other hand, is going to outspeed because it has 64 speed and I only have 55. Luckily it misses Hypnosis, I hit Dig, and actually get the one-shot. I'm glad I did the extra training, both Morty and the rival weren't a problem. And you know who else is not going to be a problem? Chuck. As a bug poison type, Eridos takes a quarter damage from all fighting type moves. This means the Polyrath is most likely going to be prioritizing Surf, and while that move can do some decent damage, it's not doing nearly enough, so after three turns with Return, my Eridos wins against Chuck. Now that I have Fly, I can go back to the first route of the game and pick up the Pink Bow to increase the power of normal type moves. I did this before the Rocket Plotline because I still need to rely on Return until all of these trainers are defeated. Then I can go north of the city, talk to this guard and get TM36, which is Sludge Bomb. I teach it in the place of Nightshade, and now I have a much better move when compared with Return. Even after the normal type move maxes out due to friendship, it's still not going to be doing as much damage as the same type attack bonus poison type move. This fact made me realize that I should definitely backtrack to pick up the poison barb so I can boost its damage since it's going to be my go-to move. You know, it's really nice in Generation 2 when you don't have to just spam Return the entire time, and it's really refreshing when the Pokemon actually gets a good same type attack bonus move. Although it was through TM, thanks Game Freak. Okay, so Price, Sludge Bomb on the seal, that's a one shot. Next he sends in Dugong, which does survive my Sludge Bomb on a sliver of health, although Aurora Beam doesn't lower my attack, so I'm in a good position against the Piloswine. Return does more than half, Chuck's AI is terrible, he chooses Mist, giving me two free turns, and with that his ace falls. But with him out of the way, I might get a boost to my special attack stat, not my special defense, remember there's a glitch in Generation 2, but I'm also gonna have to face Jasmine next, and I don't really have a good option option for her. From generation 2 to 5, steel types resist ghost moves as well as dark moves, hidden power is banned in my first playthroughs, and even if I leveled all the way to psychic, I would still only be doing half damage. Agility can't help because there's no badge boost glitch, well, no badge boost glitch that helps the player in generation 2. What I'm going to do instead is go to Goldenrod City, head south to this little hidden area, and fight these three trainers. Defeating them gives me the option to pick up the soft sand, which will improve the damage of dig by 10%. Okay, this is about as much as I can do, so hopefully Hopefully at level 41, Eridos is going to be able to defeat Jasmine. Dig is of course going to be a one-shot on both the Magnemites, that is a foregone conclusion. The Steelix is the only Pokémon on her team that I'm really worried about. Now even with super effective damage, Iron Tail is still going to do more than Rock Throw, so it's prioritizing this move, which is quite inaccurate. It has a 25% chance to miss. Even when it hits, it looks like it's only doing about a quarter to Ariados. I'm a little bit concerned that it's going to lower my defense at some point, or that Jasmine is going to use a Hyper Potion, but Dig is doing a third to her Pokémon, and she just doesn't use the potions, so I win. I think I got lucky 
see there. It would be really unfortunate if I don't save after a gym leader battle and then I battle a random NPC in the rocket plotline. When I'm doing these challenges, I usually have some other kind of content on an additional monitor, or maybe I glance away to look at the RBY XP router to see a damage range. When this happens, sometimes I accidentally overteach the move that's in the first slot, which happens to be Sludge Bomb, and I learn Spider Web in its place. There is no way I want to complete this challenge without my best move, and there is no additional Sludge Bomb TM available, so that's it. I'm gonna reset here and go back and face Jasmine again. Luckily for me though, she just doesn't use a Hyper Potion again. Thanks, Jasmine. Petrol. Dig one-shots all of his Pokemon, except the Weezing. Simple fight. Next is the rival in the underground, and here, Sludge Bomb is fantastic. I have Dig for the Magnemite, so again, another easy fight. After rescuing the director in the underground, I go into the department store to buy some vitamins. In this case, I choose three calcium to boost my special attack and my special defense, because they have a unified stat experience quantity in Generation 2. I go to Ice Path next, picking up the Rest TM, which will be useful later in this run. Then, I go back to the Radio Tower, finish off this plot line. The executive, even though he has fire types is just not relevant due to his levels. And with that, we have arrived at the final Johto Gym Leader. Claire is only a threat when you don't one-shot her dragon arrows. But with Sludge Bomb and the Poison Barb, that is more than a guarantee with Area Dose. Last is Kingdra, and if you one-shot the dragon arrows, you're gonna two-shot her ace. The only fear I had is if it's gonna use Smokescreen, but it doesn't, just choosing Surf, so that's a win for me. On my way to Victory Road, I battle some optional trainers. This is to level up. And on the way, I learn Agility in the place of Leech Life. This move is going to be key for Area Dose's late-game success. Although I should say for the battles in the immediate future, I don't think it's gonna be that helpful. I guess I can use it against the rival to outspeed his Sneasel, but that was the only Pokemon faster than Ariados and only by one speed. Plus, I have moves that are really good against his entire team, so no problems here. Okay, so Ariados is ready for the Elite Four. Wheels first, and at level 55, which I achieved during the rival fight, my speed is exactly 93. So faster than his first Zatu, a speed tie with his Jinx, but I am slower than his final Zatu. It comes in second and uses Psychic, which does about half. Luckily, Sludge Bomb takes care of it in a single hit. This lets me level up, which would have speed tied the Zatu, but it does let me outspeed the Jinx, which he sends in third. From there, it's really easy to clean up his final two Pokemon. Koga's next, and in Generation 2, he can always give out resets because his Crobat loves to spam double team. Plus, in this case, it has a flying-type move, Wing Attack, which is doing a lot of damage to Ariados. And because my accuracy is lowered, I'm just not able to attack it enough, and that results in a reset. In this fight, I also have to be careful against the Venomoth, which is, of course, a flying Psychic-type. It has Gust and Psychic. Luckily for me, I'm just one-shotting. So, will I get lucky against the Crobat? And the answer is yes. I hit two returns in a row, then miss one, and hit my fourth, allowing me to knock out his Ace. From there, Fortress is slow. I have to use Return to knock it out. If I go for Dig, it's going to use protect, and my move will just do no damage. And of course, Sludge Bomb has no effect. Last is Muck. I can use Dig or Return here. I choose for Return, knocking it out over two turns. Okay, Bruno time. Sludge Bomb one-shots Hitmontop and Hitmonchan. Then he sends in Onyx. I go for Dig, which I don't think is a good choice because it does have Earthquake. Luckily, it chooses Rock Slide, likely because that move is going to do more damage. Then it sets up Sandstorm, which is doing one-eighth in chip damage every turn, but the Onyx then reverts again back to Rock Slide, and I knock it out. Last is Machamp. If I don't one-shot, it will use Rock Slide, and the chip damage from Sandstorm is making me a little bit concerned. Although, Machamp just goes for Foresight. Why did it go for Foresight? That doesn't make any sense. Anyways, it's free as a result. Last is Hitmonlee, and it is completely impotent against Ariados because of its moveset. Karen is where things usually get a little bit bumpy for most Pokemon. Also, I'm going to be setting up agility here for the first time. I want to make sure that I move first against the Gengar as well as the Houndoom, the second of which is much more important to move first against. Getting hit by a flamethrower is not going to be fun. Luckily for me, the Umbreon Sand Attack misses, and then with Sludge Bomb, I'm able to two-shot it, only sustaining damage from Faint Attack. This feels like the perfect opening to the fight against her. Next, she sends in Houndoom. I can go for Sludge Bomb, one-shotting, and then she chooses Vileplume. It's also a one-shot. Okay, Gengar. I should probably use Dig here. This makes it fail its curse, and I was surprised when Ariados has enough damage to knock the Ghost-type out. Last is Murkrow, and Sludge Bomb gets the job done. Okay, Karen wasn't actually that much of a threat. I'm surprised how well Ariados is doing in terms of resets, but if you look at its time, it's not doing well. A lot of Pokemon have finished Crystal version in this time. And also Lance is next, and he's a flying type specialist. This fight did not go the way I was expecting it to.
I thought the strategy here was fairly self-explanatory. Set up with agility so that I outspeed his team members, specifically the Charizard and hopefully the Aerodactyl. With only a single agility, I am able to do that, and then I should be able to sweep using Sludge Bomb. But the Gyarados survives on a sliver of health, uses Surf, dealing some damage before the Aerodactyl comes in. It resists my Sludge Bomb, so it's going to take two turns to knock out, and Rock Slide takes me under half health. While I am able to one-shot the following Charizard, then his ace Dragonite comes in, this thing has Fire Blast, and it's also able to confidently survive a Sludge Bomb. The powerful Fire-type move hits, gets a critical hit, and Ariados faints. I tried again hoping maybe the Dragonite wouldn't crit, but there's also another piece of bad news, because Ariados isn't always able to knock out the Charizard in one hit. This fact convinced me that I need to use Rare Candies now to boost my level. Just one takes me up to 60 over a damage rounding threshold, but I pushed things all the way up to 65, saying no to learning Psychic along the way. With the Rare Candies, I can one-shot the Charizard every single time. The following Dragonite also cannot knock me out using Fire Blast, so I survive with Orange Health, and I'm able to two-shot using Sludge Bomb. But then the following two Dragonites are able to survive a hit each, doing chip damage along the way, and Aerodose faints just before taking the win. And I mean just, because the final Dragonite lived on on red health. Now honestly looking back at this footage I'm not really sure what I was thinking. I should have taught rest in the place of return and then just healed on the final two Dragonites because they can't do very much damage. I think that is objectively the best way to get through this fight, although if the Gyarados and Aerodactyl combo together to do a lot of damage then I am going to take a lot from Fire Blast and potentially get knocked out before making it to the final two Dragonites. In this case I decided to black out here and then train with another league attempt. This time hilariously I get stopped by Koga's Fortress which uses Explosion. So I'm I'm going to take another blackout here. Beyond that, I'm able to squeeze through with a victory and move on to Lance, this time at level 64. Do note, I saved before using my rare candies previously, so they're still in my bag and I'm going to be able to use them later. In this next attempt against Lance, I get very lucky because the Aerodactyl misses with Rock Slide doing no damage. Then I can watch out the Charizard and the Dragonite strangely chooses Outrage instead of going for Fire Blast. Because of this, I'm able to move on to the final two Dragonites in a good position. I get paralyzed by the first one, but it ends up not being a problem because I have enough health to survive. Also, I want to draw your attention to a quirk here. Snowy looked into how the AI works for the Gyarados at the beginning of this battle. Hyper Beam is always deprioritized unless the user is under half health. Also, if the user is under half health, then the AI is going to deprioritize certain moves. I asked for a list of these, hopefully I'll get it later. This includes Hydro Pump, and I'm sure it also includes Blizzard and Fire Blast. Of course, since I'm already paralyzed, it's going to be deprioritizing Thunder Wave, leaving the final Dragonite only able to use Twister. Even though Blizzard would definitely do more damage, damage, and it could follow that up with Hyper Beam to knock out Ariados. But with Twister first, followed by Hyper Beam once it's under half health, I have enough health to survive and finish Lance. This win is exclusively because of the Generation 2 AI. Now it's time for Kanto, and uh, I don't have much to tell you here. This whole section of the game is always boring. I do my regular stuff like picking up Curse, picking up the Leftovers, and defeating a bunch of Gym Leaders which are all irrelevant. Are you wondering about Sabrina? Yeah, I just set up agility once, even though I get hit by sand attack, it's not enough. Accuracy debuffs in Generation 2 are just far less potent than they are in Generation 1. By the time I've finished off all the gym leaders, I am ready to make a major change to Ariados' moveset. Curse in the place of Return, keeping Sludge Bomb as my primary damage dealing move. I also give Ariados the leftovers. Okay, so against Blue, we're going to try out this strategy. Curse to set up my attack and my defense, and then Agility to heal all of the debuffs that I got to my speed. Setup takes some time, but since I'm boosting my defense, the Pidgeot can't do much to me even with super effective wing attack. Also, for some reason the AI doesn't like to use Whirlwind here. It could switch me out and destroy all my setup, but it just doesn't do that. Once I've fully set up, I have enough speed to move first against all of Blue's Pokemon, and then I go on a one-shotting spree. I kept Dig on my moveset just so I can use it against the Rhydon, doing enough damage to knock it out. From there, Sludge Bomb spam is all I need. That brings us to red, and as I said before, I kept my rare candies, so now I have a total of 10. I'm going to feed all of them to Ariados to go up to the level 83 before fighting the final trainer in the game. Note for this fight I also added Protect to my moveset because I no longer need to manage a Steel or a Rock type. This means I can foil the Pikachu's first charm, then use Agility to ensure that I move first against it. After that, I can start using Curse to set up. 
At this level, Thunder isn't doing very much damage to me, and I can also alternate with Protect to get a little bit more passive healing with the leftovers. In the end, this strategy has one flaw though. If I'm setting up against the Pikachu, I'm taking more hits from Thunder, which has a 30% chance of paralyzing my Pokemon. Once the status condition lands, even though I can increase my speed with agility, I'm still not in a good position because I'm going to be missing attacks. As a result, I take a loss, and I decide to switch out Protect for Rest instead. This is the far more reliable set I can set up on the Pikachu, then once I'm maxed out with my curses and I've got a little bit more speed so that I can move first against all of Red's Pokemon, I only need plus two for this, then I start my sweep with Sludge Bomb. Snorlax is by far his best Pokemon defensively, but even it falls to a single hit. So I clock in with my first Eridos playthrough, getting a time of 1 hour 46 minutes and 56 seconds with 10 resets, 2 blackouts at level 84. This is a game time of 6 hours and 27 minutes. Okay, so this first playthrough time with Ariados really isn't that good, however, I wasn't expecting great things from it anyway due to its design. That said, Ladian is even more unfortunately designed. For base stats, it has 55 HP, 35 attack, 50 defense, 85 speed, 55 special attack, and 110 special defense, making it essentially a fast special defender with really no physical attack, so it's going to be relying on special attacks, and that's where things get unfortunate, because if we look at its move pool, it learns no special attacking moves through level up, starting with tackle and supersonic, then getting comet punch at level 15, light screen and reflect at level 24, as well as safeguard, just so that this thing can be even more defensive, baton pass, which will be useless in a solo challenge, swift at level 42, agility at 51, and double edge at 60. Okay, Game Freak, this thing's a bug flying type, which are two physical types in Generation 2, and it doesn't get a single bug or flying type move through level up. Also, through TM and HM, it does not get a single bug or flying type move. So, no same type attack bonus moves for Ladian in this entire playthrough. Also, there are only six special attacking moves that it gets access to. Hidden Power, which is banned in the first playthrough, Giga Drain and Solar Beam, which are later into the game, Ice Punch and Thunder Punch, which can be obtained once in Goldenrod City, and Thief, which can be obtained after defeating Morty. It also gets access to some physical moves, Headbutt and Swift, which Ariados doesn't have access to. It does get Dig, even though it's a flying type, and it also has Rollout. I can see these moves being a bit useful, but I'm really going to want to stick with Ice Punch and Thunder Punch for the majority of the challenge. Unfortunately, I will not have access to them until I arrive in Goldenrod city, so until then, things are going to be pretty brutal. At least Tackle is a better starting move when compared with Poison Sting, even though I don't get the same type of attack bonus. That said, at level 7, look at my lady and do damage to the rival's Cyndaquil. It's doing about a fifth, and it does take five turns to knock his Pokemon out. I don't think I need to tell you, but I will anyways. I'm going to do all of Sprout Tower for experience, because Falconer is going to be brutal. I get close to running out of PP with Tackle, but there's still two trainers remaining, so I have to backtrack with the escape rope and then come back here to fight them. This is more inefficiency creeping into Ladian's results. Luckily it's a fast growth rate Pokemon, so by the time I'm fighting Birdkeeper Abe, I'm already level 13. That said, this thing might be a special defender, but it is not a physical defender. As you can see, Birdkeeper Abe's Spearow is doing a lot of damage with Peck. I have to consume my berry, and he still takes me under half health before I knock his single Pokemon out. This fight left me with so little confidence that I decided to grind to level 15 before fighting Faulkner. Okay, here we go. Pidgey is first. I'm gonna go for Comet Punch, my newly acquired move. Normally this move is not very good, but it is better than Tackle, especially because it hits multiple times and each one of them can get a crit. In this case, one of them does, and that lets me get by the Pidgey in only two turns. Next is Pidgeotto. It is doing a lot of damage with Gust, but luckily Comet Punch comes through and I am able to finish off the Flying type Specialist. I probably could have done this at level 13 using only Tackle, but I'd rather be safe than sorry in these first playthroughs. On the way to Azalea Town, I pick up the Miracle Seed, which will boost the power of Grass type moves. However, I'm not going to get Giga Drain until I beat Erica and Solar Beam until right before the Elite Four. Along the next route, I'm battling pretty much every trainer that I can, including Ralph, who does have a Goldeen with Peck. Luckily, no problems for Ladian. Inside Union Cave, I grab the TM for Swift, so that now I have a more consistent move than Comet Punch and Tackle. Both of them have imperfect accuracy. It was at this point in the voiceover that I decided to look up Ladian's Generation 4 learn set to see if it does better in those games where the physical special split has occurred, but it still has 
has a lot of physical moves and very few special attacking moves. You can kind of see that they tried to force in some at higher levels like Silverwind at 29, Swift is now special at level 41, and then at level 53 it gets Bug Buzz. So I guess it will be better, but they also gave it Swords Dance so that it can boost its physical attack, kind of making me think that when I eventually play this thing in Pokemon Platinum, I'm probably going to be using a physical Ladian in the later stages of the game. Especially because through Tutor, it also gets Ice Punch and Thunder Punch, but those will both be physical moves instead of special moves like they are here in Generation 2. Okay, so I did some extra training before Bugsy, I'm now level 20, let's see how this one goes. Up first is Metapod, I really wish I could set up here, but I can't, so instead I'm just going to be using Swift. Luckily the Cocoon fails its String Shot, so I'm going to be faster than the final Scyther, which is a small advantage. Once again, luckily, it does very little damage to me due to my typing, so Fury Cutter, even though it does multiply its damage every turn, it's not doing very much, and Swift is doing about a quarter on each hit, even though my physical attack is quite low. This is where I'm just going to take a moment to bemoan the fact that Ladian doesn't get any flying type moves. Faulkner's badge boosts my physical attack, and it boosts flying type moves damage by 12.5%. Ladian is a flying type and we get the same type attack bonus, making it much better for this section of the game, especially against a bug type leader. Instead here, I just have to rely on Swift and it is slow going. Now I was a little bit worried about the rival. Look at my current moves. Swift, Supersonic, Comet Punch, and Tackle. If I level up, the first move that can hit the Ghastly is, is nothing actually. Ladian cannot hit the Ghastly with any of the moves that it learns naturally. Since it cannot learn Mud Slap through TM and HM, the only way I can defeat the rival's Ghastly is with Struggle. Pretty unfortunate, when I have this much PP to spam out, it's going to take a while to deplete myself. You might be wondering if there's any egg moves, prior evolution moves, or event moves that might help Ladian in a scenario like this, so I looked it up. By breeding, it gets Bide, Light Screen, and Psy Beam, the last of which would be very helpful in the early game. I think it would actually dramatically change Ladian overall as a Pokemon in this game, plus I would just one-shot the Ghastly. I decided to go and fight more trainers to spam out the rest of my PP, and then I uh, run into Hiker Anthony, who has a Geodude. It does four times damage to Ladian with Rock Throw, and here is where I take my first reset. Okay, so so I'm not going to fight Hiker Anthony. Instead, let's try the rival because maybe there is a solution that doesn't involve struggle. And that is spamming Supersonic against the Ghastly and waiting for it to knock itself out with self-inflicted damage. I can't believe I'm saying this, but the move with 55% accuracy comes through for me. The Ghastly does knock itself out and I move on to the Quilaba. Okay, not bad, not bad. I go for Swift, it does a quarter. Ember does less than a quarter to me because I have high special defense and, and it burns me. Okay, so now my damage is halved, which means Swift is doing very little, and each turn I'm taking chip damage, so Ladian faints. I tried it again, this time not making it by the Ghastly without getting paralyzed. I figured this is not going to work out, so I'll just reset quickly. In the next battle, I run out of supersonic PP against the Ghastly, so I can't even knock it out. This is the curse of 55% accuracy. I start resetting right away whenever I get paralyzed, because playing out the fight doesn't make any sense. Now, I think I got really lucky in the first battle, because knocking the Ghastly out is quite the tall order with supersonic, and it just keeps getting me over and over again. After the reset counter reaches 11, I finally make it back to the Quilava, but I have red health, so this is not going to work. We should try the struggle strategy. I backtrack to Union Cave to fight trainers that I've forgotten until this point. Their boosted experience yields will help me level up more, improving struggle's damage when I eventually have to use it. This is just a more efficient way of reducing my PP. Although, I realized while doing this that I actually want to level to 24 and then take some of the defensive moves into the battle with me. So I go back to the Pokemon Center, heal up, and then continue my training against wild Pokemon, which is very slow and inefficient because we're in Johto. I just want to say, if we could get rollout before this fight, things would be so much better, but unfortunately that's walled off just after Goldenrod City. I guess one way around this problem would be trading your lady into another game, then using the rollout TM in that game to teach it the move, and then you could send it back. But you could also do that with Ice Punch or Thunder Punch, and I think those would be the far better options. At level 24, I put Light Screen in the place of Comet Punch, and then Reflect in the place of Tackle. However, I need to keep Supersonic for the Ghastly and Swift as my primary damage dealing move, but I really want Safeguard to avoid things like Burn, Paralysis, and Sleep. So I'm going to teach this in the place of Reflect, and I'll just take a little bit more damage from physical moves. Alright, here's how the strategy goes. We're going to use Safeguard on the Ghastly to try and block all of its status conditions. Once that's established, then I can spam Supersonic and knock it out with self-inflicted damage. Surprisingly, this works out for me in the first battle, and I get by the Ghastly on green health. 
This is a fantastic position to be in, however my light screen fades right as the Quilava comes in. I re-establish it and now I'm taking very little damage from Ember, plus with Safeguard in place my Ladian can't be burned. This gives me the time I need to attack the Quilava, and at my new level I'm only taking 3 hits with Swift to knock it out. Maybe all the defenses weren't really necessary, but they at least made me feel better about this fight, and I like using moves that usually don't have that much utility. Zubat is last, it confuses me, and I was a little bit scared here, because Ladian does hit itself once. I take a bite. Luckily it's not doing very much because of my nice special defense. And with that I finish off his bat and now I'm on my way to Goldenrod City. This is where things are really going to change for Ladian. At least I expect that they're really going to change. After rescuing Farfetch'd and getting the HM for cut, I backtrack to Azalea Town to pick up the charcoal, which is a free item that this guy gives you. It's not useful as a held item because Ladian can't learn Fire Punch, which I find a little bit strange. It gets Sunny Day, I know most Pokemon do, but I could see it getting Fire Punch alongside Ice Punch and Thunder Punch. I don't know, maybe they thought a bug wouldn't be using Fire type moves, I, I guess that's fair. The reason I'm picking this up is so that I can sell it for money to buy the TMs for Ice Punch. Punch and Thunder Punch. In the forest I pick up the Headbutt TM, but I'm really not going to want to use this, but I will teach it in the place of Supersonic. In the department store I sell the charcoal and purchase both of the TMs, teaching them to Lady and immediately. My moveset now is Ice Punch, Headbutt, Thunder Punch, and Safeguard. I've kept this last move around just to avoid some other annoying status conditions that can come down throughout the mid game, specifically Morty with Hypnosis as well as Chuck's Hypnosis, and maybe Price getting the occasional freeze. In National Park I grab the Dig TM and I will teach this to Lady and now I decide I had to put it in the place of headbutt. I guess that move isn't really going to be used at all in this playthrough. I really want the ability to break Whitney's combos with rollout, because unlike Ariados, Ladian takes 4 times damage from rock type moves. Whitney's Clefairy takes 3 hits to knock out instead of 2, luckily it only does damage on one of the turns. I need as much health as possible to survive hits from the mill tank. After my first turn of Ice Punch, which I'm hoping for a freeze, I don't get it, and rollout does a lot of damage, although not as much as I was expecting. I use Dig to break the combo, which gives me another Ice Punch. I'm hoping for a freeze here as my path to victory. I know it's not a great solution, but it feels like the only thing that I can go for. I take the Miltank down to red health, and then it gets me. But since I got so close, I'm actually not that scared of this fight. Eventually either Rolla will miss, or I'll get a freeze from Ice Punch, and that will give me the win. In the very next battle, Miltank's Rollout misses, and that's all I need, so Whitney is defeated. Sudowoodo's next, it doesn't have any AI, so it has no idea that it should be using Rock Throw, and that gives me an easy win. I'm not going to do as much training around at Critique City as I did with Ariados. I decide after defeating the Kimono Girls to go to the Lighthouse instead of going all the way to the Lake of Rage. I just don't think Ladian needs that. The reason is pretty simple. I was thinking that Dig was going to be good enough against the rival in Burned Tower. With Ariados, I really wanted the speed to move first against the Haunter, but in this case, I easily have that. Unfortunately, I don't have the damage range. The Haunter survives with a tiny sliver and uses Curse, which ends up in a loss for me. I thought maybe I could roll favorable damage against the Haunter, but I actually roll worse damage in the next fight, so once again it survives. If I'm relying on Dig, then every turn I'm going to take Curse damage, so these moves have really strong negative synergy together, and I have to use this move against the Magnemite that follows. For the Quilava, I tried using Thunder Punch, but this isn't working out and I take another reset. Alright, I was wrong. I'm gonna go to the Lake of Rage and fight trainers along the way. Doing this levels me up to 33 over the next damage rounding threshold, which should be enough to one-shot the rival's Haunter. At least some of the times. In this case I get it first attempt, and without Curse, the rest of his team is much easier to defeat. I can use the more powerful Dig against the Quilava, but I want to examine those damage ranges just in case one of the punches is doing more damage because of my higher special attack. At level 33, Dig does do more damage, 70 to 84%, but it's always gonna two hit unless I get a critical hit whereas Thunder Punch does 50 to 59% damage, meaning it's always going to 2 hit as well. There is a slim chance if I get a critical hit with Thunder Punch that it will not 2 shot, but it still has a 6% chance of 1 shotting, whereas Dig has a 6.6% chance of 1 shotting. So overall Thunder Punch is probably the better move to be using against the Quilava here, it's slightly more turn efficient, plus it has a chance of paralyzing, and it has roughly the same chance to knock out. Whenever doing analysis of these battles, the key thing to remember is the number of turns it takes your Pokemon to knock out the enemy Pokemon. If that number of turns is the same, always use the move that is more consistent or has more upside, which in this case is Thunder Punch. Morty is next and I'm going to be using Dig for him. Also, notice here that I'm holding the Magnet, this is an item you can pick up south of Ecritique City, to boost the damage of Thunder Punch. That was factored into the damage ranges you saw previously against the rival. It's not really relevant here, but I don't need to be holding the Mint Berry, because after one-shotting both the Ghastly and the Haunter, then against Gengar I can use Safeguard, outspeeding it, which blocks Hypnosis, and by doing this I 
essentially get a free win because Morty is really only good if he puts your Pokemon to sleep. Surfing towards Chuck's gym, there are a lot of trainers. And believe me when I say I'm going to fight almost all of them. I want to level up as much as possible in this section of the game because Jasmine I expect to be brutal. Rock Throw is going to do double damage to Ladian, meaning the Steelix will choose it over Iron Tail. Additionally, Dig is not very good, although it will knock out her Magnemites, but I don't think Ice Punch is going to have quite the oomph that I would want it to have against her ace. All of this training is actually pretty efficient because Ladian has the fast growth rate, so it levels up quickly here, and I'm also able to knock these Pokemon out fast because I have Thunder Punch, which is super effective against all the water types. Inside the gym, I'm using special moves against the Hitmons, which never feels very good. They have great special defense. They're slow to knock out, but luckily they don't cause me any problems. And speaking of problems, coming up next is Black Belt Knob. If you don't know, this guy was the translator for the games, so we've given him nice little special channel art, but he's also got this art because his Machoke is terrifying when you take 4 times damage from rock type moves, because it knows rock slide. I was expecting to have a reset here, I think I'm gonna need to get lucky in order to defeat him, and then I just crit with Thunder Punch and knock the Machoke out in one hit. Okay, that was great! In RBYXP Rooter I checked the damage ranges while doing this narration, and I was being far too scared here. Rock Slide only does between 48 and 57% damage when my Ladian is at this level. Plus, Thunder Punch had a guaranteed 2 hit, so I was gonna win here unless the Machoke got a critical hit. And even if it got that, it would've had to roll on the higher end of its damage. Plus, Rock Slide has a chance to miss, so in the end it only has a 2.8% chance of knocking Ladian out in one hit. Okay, time for Chuck. I'm holding the Mint Berry here. That doesn't make sense. I should've just safeguarded on the Primeape, which can do basically nothing to me, and then used Thunder Punch against the Polyrath. It doesn't matter though, because Chuck is awful. He uses Mind Reader with his only turn, and then a two-shot. It's time to begin preparations for Jasmine. This involves picking up Rare Candies, getting the Soft Sand, and then battling Price. Initially, I was a little bit worried about him, but I get quite lucky here. I one-shot the Seal with Thunder Punch, but then the Dugong gets paralyzed and can't attack. Now his AI is a little bit weird because it likes to choose Fury Attack even when Blizzard will do more damage. In this case he chooses it twice with the Swine, and ironically I'm able to knock it out with Ice Punch. For all of you wondering how lucky this fight was, it really wasn't that lucky. Ice Punch has a guaranteed 3 hit on the Swine, and Blizzard only does between 27 and 32% damage. So it's always going to do less than a third. Okay time for Jasmine, I have prepared for this one throughout the majority of the mid game and uh, you can see that with the timer. I am now approaching 1 hour and 10 minutes into this playthrough and I haven't even beat the 7th gym leader. Of course with the soft sand, Dig is able to one hit both Magnemites and I move on to the Steelix. For it I'm going to be using Ice Punch and I do just shy of half and it also does a similar amount of damage to Ladian with its hit from Rock Throw. That puts me in a very unfortunate position because if I don't two hit then the Steelix is going to knock me out with Rock Throw. Maybe I need to be level 48 or 50 in order to get the guaranteed two hit range. However in this case with my fourth attack I roll better damage and the Steelix Felix does go down to only two hits. We really need to look into damage ranges there, so apparently I actually got unlucky with my first attacks because Ice Punch has a 73.5% chance of two hitting. It does between 47 and 55% damage with each hit. Plus there is more upside for Ladian because it has a chance to freeze. I go to Ice Path next, collecting the Never Melt Ice to improve the damage of Ice Punch. Right now if you look at my overlay in the top left, Thunder Punch is doing less damage when compared with Ice Punch because Price's badge boosts the damage of all Ice type moves, but I need Surge's badge to get the same boost for electric moves. I don't switch out my item during the Rocket plotline though because I want to have the Soft Sand for Petrol at the top of Radio Tower. Although this is a mistake because Dig, while it has a higher effective power and is super effective, it's not doing enough to one-shot the coughing, whereas Ice Punch is doing enough to one-shot. Earlier on I should have switched to the Nevermelt Ice to improve my damage on my special moves. Underground Rival Time, for this fight I have the Nevermelt Ice, I one-shot the Golbat, and the Magnemite goes down to a single dig. These are by far his most intimidating Pokemon because if you didn't notice during the Eridos playthrough, his ace has not evolved yet into Typhlosion. It's still Aquilava, and it's really bad. Return, 3 Protein, 5 Calcium, and now Claire. As I said before, the key is one-shotting the Dragonairs, and with Nevermelt Ice with Ice Punch, I am able to do that at level 53. Kingdra is a little bit more complicated with Ladian when compared with Ariados because I have to 3 hit using Ice Punch, so small disadvantage for this regional bug. Luckily for me, her ace just goes for Dragon Breath over and over again which doesn't do very much damage and as a result I take an easy win. The rival before the league is similar to in the underground, although his lead is much worse, it's Sneasel. I'll just draw your attention to the fact that I'm holding agility on my moveset now for the same reason that I had it with Ariados. Late into the game it's going to be useful to combo together with Curse, although this strategy may work out less well because of Ladian's extremely low physical attack.
attack. But we don't have to worry about that just yet because I'm going to be mostly a special attacker during the Elite Four. Will is fairly straightforward because Ice Punch and Thunder Punch give great coverage against his Pokemon. I use Dig on the Jinx, which does not one-shot. It doesn't even come close, only doing about half. I tried to go for a special move, Thunder Punch, after that, and it fails to knock out. Luckily, Lovely Kiss misses. The Ace Satu is also a one-hit, and from there, his final two more defensive Pokemon are not an issue. In this case against Koga, the double teams are not the problem. Instead, it's toxic. Once I'm poisoned, I have no way to heal, and because of that, I take a reset. In the next battle, the Crobat isn't able to use Toxic. Instead, the Venomoth does, which means it's a little bit later into the fight. Due to this, as well as a freeze on the muck, I am just barely able to pull through with a win. While Koga was bumpy, Bruno is where things get really tough for Ladian, because Onyx and Machamp both have Rock Slide. Onyx is irrelevant though, because it's a terrible Pokemon, and of course Ice Punch one-shots. Then things get really unfortunate, because Hitmonchan survives my attack, very confidently I will say, I'm using a special move. It goes for Fire Punch, and this burns Ladian, so my attack is now cut, I'm also taking chip damage every turn, and I'm not able to one-shot the Machamp, not even close to getting half damage. It uses Rock Slide, and that's a reset. I tried again so that I could see how this works out without a burn, and I've still taken over a third in damage by the the time the Machamp comes in. There's no way I'm going to survive a rock slide and Ice Punch doesn't freeze. Okay, let me draw your attention to the bottom left where you can see my experience. Right before the Bruno battle, after Koga, I have gained 1% of experience towards the next level, which is 60. But if I use one rare candy, I can go up to level 60 and teach my Lady in Double Edge, which is a good physical move, although it does deal recoil damage. Starting in Generation 2, its base power was increased from 100 to 120. With Whitney's type boost, this is is now having an effective power of 135. I don't want to use it on the initial Pokemon in the battle, but maybe it can do a little bit more damage to the key threats like Machamp later on. I can also use it against the Hitmonchan to ensure that it doesn't get two hits. Okay, time for Machamp. I have a little bit more HP this time, but not significantly more. I again go for Ice Punch, but still Rock Slide is able to get me. I don't really feel like Double Edge changed very much material in that battle. Instead, I'm going to use more rare candies to get more levels and more more damage. I can only collect a total of 7 before the league, so I use the remainder to go up to level 66. This gives me a 2 hit range with Ice Punch on the Hitmonchan, and I move on to the Machamp. Luckily for me, I get a critical hit with Ice Punch doing more than half. I survive its Rock Slide with red health. Bruno uses a Max Potion. Aw, oh, this is going to be a loss, isn't it? Because Ice Punch isn't able to do half. I get very close to knocking it out, it's on red health, but it uses one more Rock Slide and Lady and Faints. Okay, there's still something I can change here. I can hold the Never Melt Ice for improved damage with Ice Punch once again. This won't work though if Rock Slide gets a critical hit, and I also forgot to use my rare candies. At level 66, with much more HP than previously, yeah, Ice Punch still does not do more than half to the Machamp. Rock Slide brings me down to red health, and I think without a freeze, I'm not going to be able to win here. I didn't want to wait for that luck, so I'm just going to black out here and level up more with another league attempt. The fast growth rate makes this pretty efficient. By the time I make it back to Bruno, I'm one level higher at level 67. Plus, I'm about to level up, although it doesn't happen before the Machamp, so I'm just under a damage rounding threshold. This was pretty painful. As a result, I'm not able to two-shot the Machamp, so I took another blackout to level up more. At level 68, I get stopped by Koga because of poison again. Ugh, not great. This whole thing is just not going very well. If we look at the time right now, Ladian is getting close to Ariados' time. And I think right now, unless I'm able to quickly get through Bruno on my next attempt, I am going to get a time over two hours, which is just terrible in Generation 2. But honestly, what were we expecting? Ladian is supposed to be really bad. This leaves me with fear for the day that I have to do Lady Ba. Yeah, it's really gonna be bad. Okay, so after our third blackout, we make it back to Bruno at level 70. This is over two damage rounding thresholds, which will definitely change damage ranges. And then the Hitmonchan burns me. Are you kidding me? This is so annoying. Luckily, the burn does not affect Ice Punch, so I'm able to do full damage to the Machamp, and it does do more than half. I take burn damage, Machamp misses Rock Slide, and I knock it out with Ice Punch. Alright, this is perfect, everything I need. Hitmonchan is last, it has terrible moves, and I get a freeze right here. Why couldn't have I got that on the Machamp earlier on? Anyway, time for Karen. 
This battle starts off in a really ugly way. I have to three shot the Umbreon with Ice Punch. Yes, this is my best move. I could be using Double Edge. I just really don't want to take the recoil damage. Then for the Houndoom, I'm once again avoiding recoil damage with Thunder Punch. This is not enough damage to two shot, so I have to tank flamethrowers and Ladian's going to have a reset. I do make it by her ace, but I'm both burned and at 11 hit points, so the status condition gets me when I fail to knock out the Gengar. Okay, here's how I win. I get hit by Sand Attack, I get hit by Confuse Ray. Despite these two things, I make it by the Umbreon, then I paralyze the Houndoom. Also, I rolled a critical hit against it. Because of that, I knock it out, move on to the Gengar, which I use Ice Punch on. It uses Curse, knocking itself out. I take no damage from the status condition because I'm knocking the enemy Pokemon out. This is a Generation 2 Quirk. Because of that, I can use Ice Punch on the Murkrow and the Vileplume, knocking Karen's last two Pokemon out. And Lance, um... Yeah, Thunder Punch for the Gyarados, Ice Punch for all the Dragonites. It does one shot, which is really nice at this point in the game. I Thunder Punch the Aerodactyl, but I should have gone for Ice Punch, it would have done more damage. I Thunder Punch the Charizard as well, which surprisingly gets a one hit, leading to his last Dragonite, which goes down to Ice Punch, so an easy final battle. But I want everyone to remember, Aerodos got a time of 1 hour and 46 minutes. Ladian beat Lance around the same time. Back in 1999, when purchasing either gold and silver, why why would you have picked silver version to get access to Ladian? Well, as a kid, I wouldn't have made my buying decision based on version exclusives. I would have just looked at the box art and determined which one was cooler. In my case, I thought Lugia was much cooler, so I ended up with Ladian in my game, and uh, yeah, I never used it. Obviously, this thing is just terrible. It is so bad that I don't even make it through all the gym leaders in Kanto without having a reset. Because I got rid of Dig earlier on, I don't have super effective damage against Surge's Pokemon, which makes Magneton a problem because it's a steel type. I'm paralyzed and so I get one reset here. Luckily, when I try him again, I'm able to win. I do want to mention that Ladian lost this fight when it was level 75. Surge's Pokemon are in the low to mid 40s. Luckily, no more hiccups until the end of Kanto, and then I have to face Blue. For this battle, I'm using Ice Punch Return, Agility, and Thunder Punch. Again, holding on to the status move just for red at the very end of the game. His Arcanine is quite annoying. It takes three hits to knock out, so every time he gets to low health, he chooses to use a full restore on it, and that allows him to sneak in flamethrowers as he goes. The only reason I make it by it is because I paralyze it and it can't move, so it misses hitting with a flamethrower, and as a result, I progress with the fight. I can Thunder Punch the Gyarados, Ice Punch the Executor, which is a one hit, and then use Return on the Alakazam. Okay, time to get prepared for red. I fight one wild Pokemon, leveling up to 79. Then I teach Curse in the place of Ice Punch, rest in the place of Thunder Punch, and with the leftovers, I am ready for the final battle. Okay, the strategy is the same as before. Set up with Curse, then use Agility to counter out the speed drops and sweep with a return, using rest to heal along the way. But things are much more complicated here for Ladian, because it's got the flying type. Due to this, Pikachu hits really hard every time it uses Thunder. It does almost half to me, meaning I'll only survive two hits from it. I took a quick reset, came back in, tried I tried using Return to knock the Pikachu out right away in hopes that I could set up against the Pokemon that comes in next. I assume it's going to be Venusaur with Red's AI checking Sunny Day's type interaction against my Pokemon. But it might not be if he sees his weakness against my Bug and Flying type. Anyways, I could be optimistic with both my damage range and the Pokemon he's going to send in next, because there is no way I'm coming close to knocking the Pikachu out with a single hit. By the way, Red is only going to use his full restores on his first Pokemon. This is a weird quirk of his AI. I managed to knock the Pikachu out and then then in the worst case scenario, he sends in Charizard next. All right, um, I, I guess I have to set up on the Pikachu. This is what I like to call a very bad situation. Either I get lucky here, it misses Thunder a whole bunch, and then eventually I'm able to sweep, or it just keeps knocking me out. I tried an alternative strategy with Headbutt for flinches, but this also doesn't pan out. Then I get into an extended battle against the Pikachu, where it uses Charm over and over, lowering my attack stat all the way to minus 6. Because of this, there is no way for me to sweep, so this is also going to be a loss. Now I have three rare candies that I haven't used yet, so I might as well use those now, going up to 82. I also tried teaching Protect in the place of Rest because maybe foiling the charms, setting up one or two times, might give me the one shot on Pikachu. But uh, no it doesn't. With plus one attack, I am not able to one shot Red's weak lead. So instead, I'm going to be using Curse, Headbutt, Agility, and Rest. Headbutt just for the flinch chance because I think I need it against the Charizard. But then all of the luck converges. I set up Agility turn one to outspeed the Pikachu. It misses Thunder on the next turn. Then I set up Curse, bringing my speed back to its regular value 
value, and it misses a second thunder. As a result, my health is decent and I have plus two attack. I'm gonna try for the sweep now. I use headbutt and it has enough damage to knock the Pikachu out in a single hit. Okay, please flinch the Charizard. I need this right now. I go for headbutt and it doesn't flinch. But flamethrower does not one shot because Ladian has fantastic special defense. I go for another headbutt, which is gonna take three hits to knock it out. My second hit gets the flinch I need and Charizard goes down. But I am definitely not out of the woods yet. Next is Blastoise and remember it has Blizzard, which is super effective. But the Blastoise has an AI quirk. It's gonna prioritize Rain Dance if it sees that it can't get a knockout with one of its moves. And my first headbutt causes a flinch, allowing Ladian to heal slightly more health. Blastoise then uses Rain Dance and I knock it out for free. Okay, Red sends in Snorlax next, and here I have to mention that I am getting a little bit risky. I decide to continue my setup with Curse to ensure that I one-shot both it and the following Venusaur and Espeon. The reason this is risky is if the Snorlax crits, it will do a maximum of 92% damage. If I'm not at full health, it's probably gonna one-hit. But I can use Rest, heal up, the Snorlax isn't able to crit, although it does paralyze me multiple times, which is really frustrating. Eventually, I'm able to stall it out long enough, heal up, max out my attack stat, and have enough speed to move first against all of Red's Pokemon. Headbutt one-shots the Sleeping Bear, and then Venusaur comes in next. I'm not able to get the one hit, but it just chooses Solar Beam, so it is free, leading to his final Pokemon, Espeon, which goes down to a single hit. Ladian clocks in with a dismal first playthrough result, 2 hours, 14 minutes, and 32 seconds, with 30 resets, 3 blackouts at level 83. This is a game time of 7 hours and 23 minutes. It feels like very recently I just finished playing Lunatone and Soul Rock. Those two were version exclusives that were very well balanced. And in this case, we have version exclusives that are extremely poorly balanced. Ariados was so much better when compared with Ladian. If we look at the timeline graphics, then we can see that Ariados almost beat Red in the same time it took Ladian to beat Lance. Here's a list of all the splits that I record, and in every single one of them, Ariados was ahead, finishing its first playthrough 27 minutes and 46 seconds ahead of Ladian. Looking at game time by trainers, it's very clear Ariados was ahead throughout the entire game, but if we look at levels, it tells a little bit of a different story. While Ladian normally did require a higher level to defeat most opponents, Ariados required the highest level overall to finish the game, but it still outperformed massively in terms of real time. Okay, Within this context, it seems like Ariados is an amazing Pokemon. But for some context, let's compare these results with Alekid's first playthrough from last year. As you can see from the timeline graphic, Alekid is significantly faster than Ariados. Also, if we look at game time, Alekid was the fastest of the three, so there's no weirdness going on here with Alekid getting less resets and getting a better performance because of that. It just overall is the better Pokemon, and that's pretty bad when it's a first stage baby Pokemon that I don't think was supposed to perform particularly well by itself. You're meant to get this thing and then evolve it into Electabuzz, which by the way is probably going to do pretty well in Pokemon Crystal when I eventually end up running it. Okay, I think it's also fair to compare all of the bugs that did runs in October. So that is Scyther, Scissor, Pinsir, Heracross, Ariados, and Ladian. When we do this, we see that Ladian is by far the worst. Scyther, Scissor, and Pinsir are all the best. Of course, they get Swords Dance. And surprisingly, Ariados is slightly faster than Heracross. I think this is largely because Heracross really struggles in the first playthrough because without hidden power, Power, it has no solutions to ghosts. And with Heracross, it was able to massively improve its results in follow-up playthroughs because of Hidden Power, but I don't think this move is going to be quite the miracle that Ariados needs. For my follow-up playthroughs, I'm going to be running Hidden Power Ice with Ariados because I think that gives it a good solution to Lance. For Faulkner, I fight him at level 13, and I actually come out of this split 1 minute and 16 seconds ahead of my former time, which is pretty good in the early game. I further improve my results defeating Bugsy, I'm now 2 minutes and 19 seconds ahead. In my previous playthrough, I had problems against the rival because of his Quilava, and once again, I have problems here with Ariados. And I have to say, it shouldn't really be having problems, I'm gonna survive enough embers and then knock the Quilava out using Nightshade, but it gets a critical hit doing enough damage to finish me before I get my final hit. It in. If this doesn't happen, I will have enough damage and I'll win, which is what happens in my second battle. So a frustrating first reset for this follow-up run. For Whitney's Mill Tank, using Dig to break its combo in combination with the Goldberry to gain back a lot of health seems to be the best solution that I have access to. It's not perfect by any means, but it gets the job done. Before leaving Goldenrod Town, since I have trained so much in the early game, I can pick up the Return TM and teach this to Ariados right away in the place of Scary Face, so that I have a more reliable move that's a little bit 
faster to use when compared with Dig. Throughout the mid-game, my moveset is pretty straightforward. Return, Dig, Hidden Power Ice, and then later on Sludge Bomb. Of course, once I get to level 53, I'm going to be adding in Agility, because I need that to defeat Red consistently. Against Morty, I'm using the Mint Berry, because I'm not faster than the Gengar. That's the only reason I need this held item. It comes through for me waking me up from sleep, and Dig has a one hit on the Gengar. I'm now 6 minutes and 12 seconds ahead of my former pace. Previously, I had some problems with Jasmine, but with Hidden Power Ice, I have a better chance here, because this move does more damage when compared with Dig. I unfortunately have have my second reset here because of another critical hit, this time from Iron Tail, which does too much damage and I can't survive long enough after a Hyper Potion. Just so you're aware, Hidden Power Ice does between 35 and 42% damage, so it's going to 3 hit the Steelix, meaning it'll take a total of 5 turns if she uses her Hyper Potion. This doesn't mean Eridos is consistent in this fight, but if the Steelix misses an Iron Tail, then I'll have a good time. If she doesn't use her Hyper Potion, I'll also win. If Eridos gets a critical hit, which is what happens here, then I'll defeat Steelix. There's a lot of upside here, and I was more than happy with this strategy. While it isn't a guaranteed win, it's a lot better than what I had before, and I really don't want to have to overlevel at this section of the game just to get by Jasmine, because what follows is very simple. To save time with Eridos, I skip the Whirlpool Islands candy and only pick up the one in Mount Mortar, which is faster to obtain. Once I defeat the rival in Victory Road, I level up to 52, and I can use my 6 rare candies to go up to 58 before starting the Elite Four. For damage ranges, I have a one-shot on every single one of Will's Pokemon except his Slowbro, which is going to take two turns to knock out. Things are a little bit less good for Koga, but with Hidden Power Ice, I now have super effective damage against the Crobat, and I have decent damage against the Fortress. I can sometimes 3-hit if I get lucky, but it's mostly going to be a 4-hit. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about Bruno and uh, his Hitmonlee, which for some reason, whenever I was doing voiceover in this video, I just called it different things. Like, I said his Machamp is his last Pokemon, but no, the Hitmonlee is always last. I also called it Hitmonchan. I don't know why I kept making these mistakes. I, I think the real reason is that the Hitmonlee is actually just completely irrelevant. The only thing it could potentially do that would threaten Ariados or Ladian is use Swagger, but it's never going to get the chance because it's so defensively weak. Okay, Karen is really annoying. Actually, so much so in this case, with Confusion, the Umbreon defeats Ariados, giving it its third reset. I have a fourth one from Houndoom's Flamethrower, and a fifth one from Gengar using Curse. The reason this fight is inconsistent is just because the Umbreon is so defensive and loves to use Sand Attack. If that wasn't the case, this battle would never really be that much of a problem. While I do drop some time here because of three resets, I'm still significantly ahead of my former pace going into Lance, and he was really bad for Ariados in the first playthrough. This time around though, things are much easier. With Hidden Power Ice, I have a guaranteed one hit on all three of the Dragonites. That leaves only three of his Pokemon that can really cause problems. Gyarados is probably just going to set up Rain Dance. That'll decrease the power of Charizard's eventual Flamethrower, which is good for Ariados. Hidden Power Ice is okay against the Aerodactyl, although Sludge Bomb would also get a two hit. It's just doing less damage per turn, but its minimum damage roll still does at least 50%. Beyond that, I have a chance to one hit the Charizard with Sludge Bomb, and if I've made it by his first three Pokemon, Ariados has one. I take a first First attempt victory, and now let's head off to Kanto and finish the game. I unfortunately have to bring your attention to Sabrina. I thought that I could fight her, and this is maybe a little bit overconfident. I'm going to use agility here against the Espeon to outspeed all of her Pokemon, and then I felt like as long as I don't miss a hit because of sand attack, I'm going to win. I do miss, and I take a quick reset here. Frustrating. Again, more losses because of accuracy, but overall her team isn't a threat. I just battled her again. This time the accuracy doesn't mess me up. For blue, I run Sludge Bomb, Agility, Hidden Power, Ice for the Rhydon, and Curse to set up. While this fight does look kind of close, I don't have Rest so I can't heal, it isn't actually close because once I've set up Agility, I can sweep his team with my massive attack stat. Last battle of the game, Red. This one is fairly straightforward. I'm going to Sludge Bomb turn 1. If the Pikachu misses its charm, then I'll knock it out in one hit, and if it doesn't, then it'll take two turns. Red sends in Snorlax next. Because of that, I'm going to set up Curse here, and then Agility so that I outspeed all of his Pokemon. The way that I lose here is the typical way you lose against Red when using Curse strategies against the Snorlax. If it gets a critical hit, things are probably going to go bad for me. Although Ariados can survive, so there's a chance that I can still pull out a win if it happens. But in this case, I get one. On reset. In the next battle, the Snorlax doesn't crit me and I'm able to get set up. It's rarely the case that a Pokemon needs all six curse setups to knock out all of Red's Pokemon in one hit, and in this case with the Ariados, it only needs plus three attack before it can sweep his team. I set up one extra turn just to take a little bit less damage from the 
with Snorlax, then I set up my speed, and with that I sweep his team. Ariados clocks in with a third playthrough time of 1 hour 22 minutes and 46 seconds, with 7 resets, 0 blackouts at level 74, with a game time of 5 hours and 12 minutes. I did 3 playthroughs with it, so if we compare all the results now, you can see that my third one is significantly faster than even my second playthrough, and both of these are dramatically better than the first run. Hidden Power Ice really helps against Lance, and the final run actually beats Red before the first run beat Lance. That is a massive improvement. I was also able to shave off a significant amount of game time, and then even a little bit more between my second and third playthrough. Also, I realized that I don't need to level up nearly as much, so I'm finishing these playthroughs at a much lower level, as shown here by the level by trainer graph. All of this gives me a result that is 24 minutes and 10 seconds faster than my first playthrough. I'm quite happy with these results, so now let's rank Ariados. It wasn't able to squeeze its way into the A tier, but it does get a decent placement in the B tier. Its time of 1 hour and 22 minutes and 46 seconds puts it just behind Gengar's current result. By the way, Gengar can do much better, but Gengar is also not very good in Pokemon Crystal, just because its early game is so awful. In general, right now, I think Ariados looks a little bit better than it should look. If I re-rank Pokemon like Venusaur, Gengar, Dragonite, Tyranitar, Meganium, Lapras, Espeon, I think all of them are going to move up one tier or two tiers even. Very soon I'm going to have to sort this tier list with better thresholds so that we get more normal distribution. A Pokemon like Scissor with a 1 hour, 5 minute, and 6 second time should not be ranked in the same tier as a Pokemon like Heracross with a 1 hour, 14 minute, and 41 second time. And I think overall, Ariados doesn't really deserve a B tier finish. It feels much more like a D tier Pokemon maybe, maybe a C tier Pokemon if we're being really generous. I want to come back to a result that I mentioned earlier on, Elekid. If we compare it with the legendary electric Pokemon Raikou, then we see that Elekid was able to outperform in its first playthrough. Last year this taught me an important fact about Pokemon Crystal. Move pool is king. The reason Elekid's time is lower is because he got the punches, whereas Raikou was stuck with Spark and had no answers for Lance. Of course, the Legendary outperformed in its follow-up attempts because it got access to Hidden Power, and that really solved a lot of its problems. I think what we're witnessing today, though, is one exception to this rule. While Ladian does have a far better and more diverse move pool, it is not going to perform better than Ariados. I hope that's not a surprise to anyone. Although, please stick around, because I do have some really fun plays that I think are going to make a lot of you happy for this follow-up playthrough. And just as a small teaser, I'm not going to be using Return Against Red, which is a breath of fresh air. Don't worry, I'll still use Curse though. We have to use Curse. We're using a Ladian after all. This thing is awful. Against Faulkner, I don't actually need to be level 15, but level 14 feels about as low as I want to go realistically to have a good chance of winning here. As you can see in this battle, I get taken to red health, only 4 hit points remaining, and then I knock out Faulkner's Pidgeotto. All of this extensive early game training is going to synergize together to beat the rival as fast as possible possible in Azalea Town. This battle by far is the most brutal one in the entire playthrough because Ladian doesn't have an answer to his Ghastly, other than Supersonic. So for that fight I'm once again going to run the silliest moveset, Swift, Supersonic, Light Screen, and Safeguard. Turn 1 Safeguard blocks Hypnosis and Lick from inflicting status conditions, then I can set up Light Screen, use Supersonic to knock out the Ghastly, and then finish off his team using Swift. One way this fight can go wrong is if you miss too many times with Supersonic or the Ghastly hits you with Spite, lowering Supersonic's PP. If the move runs out of uses, then I've lost. This happens once, but then in my second attempt, the Ghastly knocks itself out. Against the Quilava at level 24, I have a guaranteed 3 hit with Swift, and Ember isn't going to do much damage. Between 16 and 20% when Light Screen isn't active, so even less than that when my screen is in place. Now as I battle Whitney, I want to mention the fact that I have overleveled here. Previously I fought her at level 26 and I was able to win. This time I'm level 30. I want to mention that Rollout is the better choice against Whitney, but I want to say save the TM for later into the game. As a result, I have to be using Ice Punch and Thunder Punch, which aren't as good in this scenario. To shore up my weaknesses, I've overtrained to a higher level for a better damage rounding threshold, and I've also traded for the Goldberry to ensure that I don't have a reset here. Okay, so now as I head towards the Lake of Rage to pick up Hidden Power, let's talk about it. There are a bunch of different choices that immediately seem like they would be good. You're going to think of Bug and Flying to give Ladian a same type attack bonus move, but both of those are physical, so they use my lower attacking 
Lightning stat. I also don't think either of them solved the problems Ladian was facing, specifically the rival's haunter and the fact that it kept putting curses on me. This led me to consider two different hidden power typings, hidden power dark, which is perfect DVs, and hidden power psychic, which has 15 attack, 12 defense, and 11 HP. In the end, psychic turns out to be just a little bit better because of Bruno, and I'll discuss that when we get there. If it wasn't for him, I would have run hidden power dark in this playthrough and just used it against all the haunters. My moveset throughout the mid-game is very diverse. Ice Punch, Hidden Power Psychic, Dig, and Thunder Punch. Now, Ladian is a fast growth rate Pokemon, so it's going to level up very quickly and get to agility at 51 before too long. That said, I am not going to be using this move against Red. No matter how many times I tried testing it, Agility Curse just doesn't work well for this thing. The fact that it's a flying type, it takes too much damage from Pikachu, and that is truly ironic because this thing is supposed to be a specially defensive Pokemon. I really wish it could just tank the Thunders, set up, and then sweep like Ariados does. But Ladian has to rely on a completely different strategy for the final trainer. Okay, for Morty, I want to draw your attention to a small little thing that I do. I use Ice Punch on the Gengar turn 1 because I know that Hidden Power Psychic is going to 2 hit. Using Ice Punch in this way gives me a chance to freeze, which slightly increases my chance of success. The only way I lose here is if the Gengar uses Hypnosis and successfully puts me to sleep. But that's only a 45% chance, so I didn't feel like I needed to pick up the Mint Berry before this battle. That saves some time in backtracking because now I only walk to Olivine City once. For Chuck, I want to mention the fact that Thunder Punch with the Magnet is better against the Polyrath, but I don't need the Magnet to get the 2 hit, so I'm holding the Mint Berry just in case it uses Hypnosis. Hidden Power Psychic doesn't really make a difference in this gym, but it does help on all the random trainers that you have to face, especially in the Rocket plotline. I have access to so much PP that Ladian basically never needs to go to the Pokemon Center, provided I picked up the Aethers and Elixirs that are available throughout the run. My goal level for Jasmine is 45. You can see here at Price I'm fighting him at 43. Thunder Punch is great against the first two Pokemon, I'm going to two-shot the Dugong, and then I'm going to three-hit the Piloswine using Ice Punch. There's the potential to lose if it freezes me with Blizzard, but that's basically Price's only path to victory. Alright, Jasmine is the first trainer we need to talk about, because I am just barely squeezing through this with the damage I need. Rock Throw does between 45 and 54% damage when Steelix uses it. This means there is the chance for it to two-hit me. As a result, I really want to be able to two-shot the Steelix. Since Rock Throw only sometimes two-shots, it has a 36% chance, I felt like I didn't need a guarantee from Ice Punch. So at level 45, I have a 57.9% chance to two-shot her ace. In this playthrough, I get the damage I need, and I defeat Jasmine with no resets. Hidden Power Psychic significantly speeds up the battle against Petrol. I even get a one hit on his Weezing. This is an 80.8% chance, so I could have failed this damage range, but it's highly likely that I'm just going to sweep his entire team with Ladian. Okay, I want everyone to bear witness to what might be the worst luck I have ever gotten on Claire. I go for Ice Punch, it's gonna 3 hit the Kingdra, then it smoke screens me, not once, not twice, but three times, then Ice Punch misses so many times, and I actually run out of PP for the move. Kingdra continues being annoying, smoke screening me one more time, then it uses Dragon Breath, inflicts paralysis, I continue missing, and it knocks Lady in out with Hyper Beam. If that worst case scenario doesn't happen, I'm going to win against her. Okay, now let's talk about experience optimization. So once I beat the rival, you can see that I'm just partway through level 59. Once I finish off Will, then I'm partway through level 60. This means by the time I defeat Koga, I'm at level 61, and also just barely at level 61, like really only one Pokemon worth of experience is not usable here. Because I'm now going to use 7 rare candies, including the one from the Whirl Islands, to go up to level 68 before facing Bruno. At this level, Hidden Power Psychic has a 56.9% chance of one-hitting the Hitmontop, the Hitmonchan, and the Hitmonlee. Plus, I have a guaranteed two-hit on the Machamp, whereas other moves like Ice Punch only have an 84% chance of two-hitting, and that's at level 68. So I would need to level up more to make Machamp consistent if I wasn't running Hidden Power Psychic, and this is the primary reason I felt it was important for this run. I don't want to get hit by two rock slides and slowed down here. At level 70, the damage ranges improve even more, up to 95% against the Hitmons, but I didn't feel like the extra two levels were worth it, because I don't really need to be a super high level to defeat Red. I take care of Bruno without resets, but then Karen gets really annoying with status conditions and accuracy drops. I have a total of three resets here, which again is unfortunate, but it's always luck in this battle. I don't think leveling up really changes anything here, you just have to get lucky. I should mention that Hidden Power Psychic also comes through here, giving me slightly better damage damage against the Gengar, and I don't have to use Dig for it, which can be problematic if I'm paralyzed, confused, or if I have my accuracy dropped, then it can really waste a lot of time. 
Okay, Ladian is so overleveled now, I stomp Lance. My moveset is fantastic against him. And now, we're gonna skip all the way to the end of the game and fight Blue. For this battle, because of my level, 76 at this point, I don't actually need to run Curse to set up. I can literally just attack his Pokemon and knock all of them out. The Rhydon is a one-hit with Ice Punch. I can use Thunder Punch on the Arcanine. While this doesn't one-hit, and it doesn't even two-hit, I have enough health, and with leftovers, I can eventually knock out his Ace Pokemon. Beyond that, Thunder Punch one hits the Gyarados, Ice Punch two hits the Executor as it tries to use Solar Beam, and then Alakazam does a tiny bit of damage before I knock it out over two turns. Okay, so what is my ultimate strategy? strategy against red. Well, it is leveling up to 80, and then teaching Rollout as my primary damage dealing move. The three moves that I complement with are Protect, Rest, and Curse, the generic set. But Rollout has a specific advantage. I don't need to set up on the Pikachu. What I want to do here is use Rollout and get three turns of setup with this move, and then I can one-shot the Charizard and the Blastoise that follow with Rollout 4 and Rollout 5. Notably, I do need to continue rolling, and the Pikachu cannot paralyze me with Thunder. Also, some Sometimes it gets a little bit annoying and it uses charm a second time. That's what happens here, so I get taken to minus two attack, and because of that I don't have the damage I need to knock out the Blastoise when Rollout fails to get the knockout. Also, Rollout can miss, which causes resets, but they're much faster than reset would be if I was using Curse. Say I set up for six turns and I also use Rest a couple of times in combination with Protect, then I've wasted so much time. But in this case, if I miss on the Pikachu, it's like two or three turns, maybe a max of five turns if I miss on the Blastoise. Eventually, when Rollout does what it needs to do, I one-shot both the Charizard and the Blastoise and he sends in Snorlax. This is where I set up with Curse. I just want to ensure that I'm surviving hits from Body Slam with decent health in case it paralyzes me while I I'm using Rollout, that seems unacceptable, then against the Venusaur and the Espeon that follow. After I've set up, I've also depleted the Snorlax's Body Slams, so it's using Rest and Snore. This is good for me. I can then use Rollout, knock out the Snorlax, finish off the Venusaur and the Espeon, and clock in with my final Lady in time. 1 hour, 45 minutes and 15 seconds, with 8 resets, 0 blackouts at level 81. This is a game time of 6 hours and 35 minutes. I want to say, anyone who's a Rollout fan, congratulations, yes this move is very good. I typically don't like using it because it feels quite inconsistent, but I think overall I've probably undervalued it a little bit. I think in the coming days I'm going to have to try it out more and more against Red. By the way, every other test I did with Ladian with other moves did not work. Rollout just ended up outperforming everything, and it's the reason I didn't use it for Whitney. While I had to overlevel for that fight, I didn't want to have a ton of resets that were really slow using Curse against Red, and I think I made the right choice saving this TM until the end of the game. Okay, let's bring our two Pokemon on screen. Of course, before I rank Lady in the tier list, we need to declare Ariados as the winner of this versus video. It performs so much better, and even after Hidden Power is introduced, these two are not well balanced. If you have the game where you can catch Ariados, you're just in a better scenario, because it is by far the better bug. But why would you choose to use either of these two, unless you just really like their designs? Because they're both not particularly good in Pokemon Crystal. Here Here's a look at my Ladian timelines, I only did two playthroughs with it, mostly because I couldn't stomach doing a third one, but also I felt like my second one had decent luck with some small exceptions like Karen and Red. Overall, I'm pretty happy with this run, and it ended up clocking in with a time very similar to the champion split that I got during my first playthrough. Putting the results side by side, my second run is 29 minutes and 32 seconds faster. It had 22 less resets, 3 less blackouts, and I finished the game 2 levels lower. Plus, my game time was 47 minutes faster. Overall, I'm really happy with these results. Now, just to emphasize the fact that Ariados is much better, this is what the timelines look like when you put these two Pokemon side by side. Ariados beats the game faster than Ladian beats the champion in its follow-up playthrough. So yeah, the spider Pokemon is clearly superior. Although, I will mention the fact that Ariados only has four legs. Has anyone else ever noticed that before? I'm just realizing it right now. I was trying to record a line that was like, Ariados, the eight-legged Pokemon, and then I looked at it and I'm like, no, it's only got four legs. Why does it only have four legs? Also, how does it balance? It looks like the heavy section of its body is just like way behind its legs. It seems like it would be a lot of work or strain on Ariados' sort of like neck body middle section to hold that back up. Uh, anyways, 
I don't understand. Let's move on and rank Ladian in the tier list. If you support me through YouTube memberships or through Patreon, thank you so much. It makes these videos possible. Ladian's results today place it in the D tier, just behind Murkrow and ahead of Teddy Ursa. Honestly, I think this is fitting company. Both Murkrow and Teddy Ursa don't seem like amazing Pokemon. Teddy Ursa really struggles with red, and overall it seems like Ladian should be in a tier roughly around where Centret is. That said, I also don't think Ladian's result deserves to be D tier, so when I reshuffle the tier list, I I expect it to go down. This really does feel like an E or F tier Pokemon, maybe even a Surge tier Pokemon, but right now I don't really think that's the case. It's not nearly as bad as something like Yanma. That bug is absolutely disastrous. If you want to see why, go and check out my live stream VOD. You can relive every moment of me trying to do a follow-up attempt with that thing and failing at every turn. It was truly painful, and I have still not come back to do another run with it because I just can't stomach it at this time. We've made it here. The conclusion of my bug type series in Pokemon Crystal. I hope you enjoyed it. We played the game with two absolutely fantastic bugs, Scissor and Scyther. I did a backport with Cleavor, and Pinsir and Heracross both put up pretty good results. And then, as expected, Ariados and Ladian did not perform nearly as well. Although, I don't think that the bug type really factored into the equation too much for either of them. Sometimes it gave them weaknesses to rock type moves, which caused problems, but overall the issues that these two faced were more because of the poison and flying typings. So the thought I'm going to leave you with is maybe bug types in Generation 2 are more influenced by their secondary typings rather than by their primary typing. And of course, if they have Swords Dance, they're really good. If you've made it this far, you're incredible. I'll see you in my next video.